name is Laura Johansson. I'm an archaeologist and a maritime archaeologist. I just got my certificate through a couple of weeks ago. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Never again. Um, <laughs> um, I'd first of all like to thank Serena and James and Chris for having me to here today and speaking about our ongoing project. So, um, if you haven't worked it out from the hopefully quite familiar silhouettes, um, the ancient cultural landscape is actually referring to Stonehenge. So the reason this wasn't mentioned before is because this project has not gone public yet, so you're the first audience I'm actually presenting this to. So this whole thing started about 10 months ago, um, when we were chatting to the head of technology at English Heritage, Eric Winbolt. Um, Eric and our partner Mark Griffiths have been friends for many, many years, and they've done several projects in the past together. So he came down for a visit and we sat down and, and wanted to brainstorm a bit and see if we could develop something to work on for English heritage. Um, so these ideas eventually formed into what we call Project Owning Sunrise. So hopefully everyone here will know what Stonehenge is and I'm not going to go into the background of the site. Um, but the most popular aspect of Stonehenge is of course the tracking of the sun. So this is especially evident during the summer solstice, um, where the sun rises, um, lines up with the heel stone. But um, as probably most of you know, summer solstice at Stonehenge is a very popular gathering. I was there last summer, I there were about 8,000 people um, around the stones. So despite this being a very significant event, it's really difficult to get a picture of the sun lining up the heel stone from inside the circle. So this essentially became our main goal for the project, which then also developed into wanting to create a real-time image of Stonehenge uh, by publishing images of the site every five minutes online. So the first thing we had to do was to get a picture from the inner circle. So for this we used what we call the InsaPro 360 camera. This is a 360 camera that records the surrounding uh, landscape in 3D. Um, up to 12K image quality, so this means the browser um, quality of the picture will be really good, but you can also view it in VR, in a headset. Um, so the result of the picture we took, you can see on the bottom there, um, it has been stretched out into a equirectangular projection, which is why it looks a bit distorted on the bottom, so that's where the camera tripod stood. You may also notice that we've uh, replaced the sky with a transparent background, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. So, installing a permanent camera in the middle of Stonehenge is obviously out of the question. So, for this bit, we had to become a bit creative. So, what we did, um, we installed a second camera called what we call the Sky Cam. And there's a security bunker, sort of 25 metres northwest of the site. So you have Stonehenge here, and that's the bunker there. And the top image shows what it sort of looks like from the top. Um, so the second camera is a cheap camera that is on the bottom left there. This is a 220 degree fisheye lens um, that is pointed towards the sky. Um, and this was then installed on the fence, you can see in the top picture there. So just where the antennas are sticking out, that's where we placed it. So these are some of the images this camera has produced. So they are circular, but they are 360. Um, other skies do have daytime, sunset and night. Um, the night one is completely black because the camera is not very good quality so it can't really distinguish much light um, in the night time. Sometimes we do get a bit of light in there because there's an army base at Lark Hill and they do um, nighttime training, so sometimes we have the helicopters and things going past. Um, so the camera itself um, is just a static camera, so we had to publish these images somehow, so what we came up with is what we call the Skybox. So the main component in the Skybox is a Raspberry Pi computer, and this is very much make a tech. This is just something we got all the pieces and put them together to create something that could work for us. 
So the Raspberry Pi regulates the picture capture intervals. Um, it also processes the picture and uploads it to a secure browser uh, via Wi-Fi link. The uh, Raspberry Pi in turn is run uh, powered by a lead acid battery that's in the bottom of the box, uh, which is harnessing power from two solar panels that we also installed on site. So this means the whole box, the whole camera and everything is all self-sufficient and it runs 24-7 and we don't have to be there. So the other thing we also installed is a environmental sensor. So this one records the temperature inside the box. It also records pressure, but most importantly, it records color of the site. And all this data is uploaded to a site called Freeboard. And if you just bear with me a second, if I can close this, I'll show you what it looks like. So typically, the site went down as I was driving here. And this is thanks to BT, <laughs> love BT. Um, this seems to happen every two weeks, so we don't know why, but hopefully we can get it fixed before the big launch. So this is essentially what we see on our end. So where there's a black rectangle, that's where the current picture should be. And I was hoping I could show you a picture that's literally just been taken on Stonehenge. But as you can see, the last heartbeat was 6 a.m. this morning. So that's when the camera went down. And the last sky capture was uh, 3 a.m. So that's why it's all black. It was in the middle of the night. But you can see on the top there, there's the um, solar flow voltage. voltage. So this shows us um, the camera stars. At the moment, it's um, not showing properly because the camera is down, so it's not reading it. Um, but normally at this time, so the daytime is around 12 volts. So it keeps goes down to 2.23 volts in the nighttime and then charges up as the sun comes back up. And uh, we also have some graphs on the side there. So we see the light level sorry, the voltage and the light level, along with the color hex um, of the site. And then you have the internal temperature of the box, as well as the pressure, so we can tell when it's going to be raining, basically. Right. So, now we have a base image, I mean, have a sky image. So now we're about basically trying to create a single image that we can put online for people to view. So the color record I mentioned is the most essential part of this process. Um, because we have the base image that we took several months ago, and we have a real-time image of the sky taken every five minutes, um, and because it's taken every five minutes, you'll have various light levels throughout the day, so you, we need to make it look like it is all the same image, basically trick the eye. Um, so to tackle this, the color recorded sensor tells us what the light levels are. And with this, we can create a filter that we put on top of the two images to sort of bond them together. Um, so to show what this looks like, so this is the base image with the sky cut out. Um, this is sunrise. So you can see the base image is a lot darker. And then we have daytime, which is about the same. And then we've got sunset, so you can even see a lens flare there from the camera that's come in. So this is admittedly taking some artistic license, but if you didn't know the trick, you wouldn't really notice the difference, to be honest. So we now have a single image, but what we wanted to do was to highlight the sun's role in this process. So we... Sorry, I missed my way. Yes, so we accessed a digital array that tracks the suns and planets' movements, so you can access them online. And what we did was we got uh, the coordinates for Stonehenge and worked out how this would be projected from inside the circle where the image was taken. And this grid was then placed on top of the Skycam's pictures that were taken. Um, so with this, we can then draw in lines. I realise it's probably quite faint for people in the back, but there are some lines that tracks the exact location of the sun and the planets, um, so you could view it in the same image if you want to. So we have had some issues, and I won't go through them all, 
but it's definitely not been a walk in the park. So one of the biggest issues we have is the sky cam has things invading it, its view. So this include things such as rain, uh, people, ravens, and this becomes a problem when we stretch it out to an equirectangular projection. So this is a rainy day, um, so this is taken with the sky cam. This is what it looks like when you stretch it out, so you can see there's some very massive sort of mile-long rain blobs around Stonehenge at the moment. We have people, this area is not uh, protected in any way, people will pass there all the time and we can't stop them going up to the camera. So we have a giant man <laughs> just standing behind Stonehenge. And then we also have ravens that likes to sit on top of the camera. So in this case, it kind of looks like something out of a horror film, <laughs> especially like the eye that's just up there sticking out. So we had to find a way to overcome this because we can't sit there and manually go through every picture it takes. So to sort this out, we use a program software called AWS Recognizer. So what it does, it analyzes the image that's taken, that's uploaded from the Skycam, and basically tell us what it can see. So in this case, we have a nice sunny day, some clouds. So it's identified the image as 88% porthole, which sort of makes sense because of a circular projection. 80% um, window and 50% emblem, which I'm not really sure what it's about, but it's all good. We can publish this. And we can then tell the system that this is a K, you can publish the image. But we have the same rainy image. And you can see it is identified as 68% slow cooker. And whoever's taken a slow cooker picture and put it into the system, kudos to you, I don't know why, but this is what it does. And basically, if the system uh, it's being told that it recognizes a slow cooker, this is a bad image, don't publish it. So instead, it will replace that image with the generic image that we produced, and this will just keep being posted until it finds the picture that it can pass the inspection. So essentially, the final product is going to look something like this. So this is still a work in progress, it's not being launched, but it's going to go on stonehengelive.com. So essentially what you have is a browser window with the 360 view so you can use your mouse to pan it. Um, you will have every, um, so you have the real time in the middle and then you've got the sunrise and the sunset times as well. You have an orrery filter you can put on so you can see the tracks of the planets if you want to. Um, and you can just pan it around 360 degrees. There's also a compass on the bottom so you can sort of keep track of which way you're facing. Um, so this is essentially what it's going to look like and it hopefully be published by the end of this year. I'm also going to put it up on uh, some details up on my own website, which is uh, maritimearcheolog.com, which is the same as my Twitter handle. Um, but this one is also under construction, so it's not anything up there yet. But if you do want to know when this is becoming live, then follow me on Twitter because I will post the update for that. So. Just finally, I wanted to answer some of the questions that were uh, posed by the um, session organizers on the website. I've shortened these down because as you probably noticed, I don't particularly like text on my PowerPoint. Um, but basically what I wanted to say um, from the view of our project is that it's not really important to be good artist or archaeologist in this case to achieve what we have achieved. Um, I will say that all three of us are very creative people, but our skills range from things like music, photography, illustration, digital design, so it's very diverse. Um, in this case, I would say you need some technical proficiency, but if you're a person that is willing to learn on the go um, and think outside the box, you can definitely do this. Um, I would definitely say it's very much an experimentation. It's been that from start to finish. We had no idea what we were setting out for when we first started this. But at the end of the day, what we wanted to do was to tickle the viewer's imagination and show a World Heritage site from a different point of view. Thank you.